Welcome to One on One. I'm Phil Tillman, your host, and today, in our effort to interview candidates for local and state government, we're delighted to welcome into our studio Johnny Mouts from St. Michael's. Phil, thanks a million for inviting me. It's great to be here with you. Well, you, you get the award for coming the longest distance to be in our studios here on the campus of Salisbury University. And uh, we're really glad to see you again, because I've met you before several times. Uh, Johnny, tell us a little bit about the district you're running from. Well, first, you know, uh, Wicomico is an important part of our district. I'll tell you about the district, but any chance I get to come to Wicomico, I take advantage of it. Um, it's important to be down here, and it's important to meet people, and I take advantage of that chance whenever it comes up. Uh, 37B is a multi, uh, multi-member uh, multi-county sub-district of the Senate District, which is District 37. Um, that includes all of Talbot County, uh, and Caroline County includes uh, Preston and Federalsburg. In, in, in Dorchester County, it's, it's uh, North Dorchester and South Dorchester, which includes the Neck and South Dorchester. And in Wicomico, it stretches you know, into West Side. It includes Sharptown and wraps around, it, it does a, a, a squiggly line through Fruitland and then loops up around the other side of Salisbury. So it's very interesting. I found it challenging many times talking with people, trying to figure out whether or not they're even in the district, particularly in Wacomico. Well, I guess the election board will do a pretty good job. A lot of us in Wicomico County find ourselves in a district different from what we voted the last time. Some of us are even voting a different mm -hmm. voting place. But anyway, uh, it is what it is. It happens every 10 years, and uh, we're delighted that you and quality people like you are putting your name in the hat, and we, we appreciate it. And this is our opportunity in Wicomico to get to know Johnny Mounts. First of all, I had to figure out how to pronounce your last <laughs> name, <John. laughs> Well, we've talked about the demogra a little bit about the demographics of the districts, the district, what are the major issues that you're hearing uh, going into this election? Well, the, 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 the biggest, most significant issue facing the Eastern Shore is our economy. The economy affects all parts of, of our community, and I think that is the most challenge, it's the greatest challenge that, that most people are facing right now. Well, what, uh, what can state government do to impact the economy? Well, uh, our economy on the eastern shore is different than the western shore. You know, uh, a bulk of our economy is small businesses. It's working men, women. Um, it includes um, uh, restaurants like the one my family has and I'm operating right now, uh, farmers, watermen. Um, when, when the government, when we create new taxes, when we create new fees, or we have regulations that make businesses do more than they ordinarily would have to do, that don't achieve you know, a net result um, that, that, that's beneficial, um, that burden is heavier on small businesses than it is big business. And I think you know, what's happened in our state and some of our state's policies have, um, have, 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 had a, have, a head, have had a heavier burden on the Eastern Shores economy than it has the Western Shores economy, which, you know, is, um, which is fueled by the federal government. Well, Johnny, um, you mentioned this small business that your family is in. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Thanks for asking. And, you know, my name, Mouts, is a funny one, and I hold everyone harmless. You can say it however you like. I've heard Mots, Moots, Mouse, you know, whatever works is fine by me. It's, um, it's just an honor and a privilege, and I'm just humbled to be uh, on the ballot for the general election. And, uh, you know, I grew up in St. Michael's, a small fishing town when I was a child, um, and my parents purchased a, a restaurant in town when I was the age of 10. It's Carpenter Street Saloon. I started out there as a dishwasher and worked my way up uh, to the front of the house, you know, bussing tables. Eventually, let me wait tables and you know, I bartended for a couple of years. Um, the experience was, was grueling. You know, I usually got the last job that most people didn't want to take, but I was always there. It's good to have a family, you know, have the, uh, have the failing family siblings nearby. But um, that was through my youth. And um, at times, the restaurant got a little got a little old and I wanted to stretch out or do something different so I, I spent some summers working on some uh, crabbing boats calling crabs and spent a couple summers uh, picking clams on clam boats we did a little um, uh, marine construction driving pilings building piers and bulkheads mm. 
I even spent some time building some, as a laborer, building homes. But that was growing up in St. Michael's, and it was a great experience. I'm now I'm running the uh, running the saloon. Um, mid, you know, at, at my older years, we ran into some situations where we had to consult uh, legal offices for for advice, and uh, we'd sit down, and there three different offices would give us advice on how to deal with an issue. It just didn't make sense to me. I said, you know, I, I thought about it. And I said, well, we need a lawyer in the family, so I'll go to law school. Now, that was a great idea. I worked hard. I got into law school, and I realized midway through law school what being a lawyer really meant. And I knew that I couldn't come back to St. Michael's and practice law because we knew so many people in the community. I couldn't, you know, fully represent one person to go after a friend or a friend's, you know, cousin or something like that. So I had to figure out what to do. Um, I was still helping my family out in the restaurant. I was going through law school, and I found an opportunity to work work in Washington as an intern. I first uh, interned, actually interned for the Clinton administration in the Department of Interior in the solicitor's office. That was a purely legal position, not political at all, but it was an eye-opener into working in the executive government. Um, after that, I had an opportunity to work on Capitol Hill as an intern, and that was a fast-paced, um, uh, you know, uh, when they tinsel town with the cameras and you see the all the all the all the talking heads and the new the TV people and boy that was just fascinating so I did that for another year and uh, when I graduated law school there was an opening at one of the offices that I worked in and and uh, they offered me employment so I joined the office and you know the turnover on Capitol Hill is pretty rapid and within four years I had moved up the ranks to a full-time council and I was advising members of Congress on a number of different bills and and all sorts of things and uh, I stayed along stayed on the on in working in Congress and Governor Ehrlich was elected and um, he was filling out his office after he was elected and I, I sent a resume and the governor picked me out of the out of the pile of resumes and I joined his office and you know growing up on the Eastern Shore being a Republican and having a chance to work at the top of Maryland's government was a opportunity I just uh, was was it had never been presented before, something I even imagined would be available. Um, and I, that was a great time. I really enjoyed working with Governor Ehrlich. I learned a lot working with him and with the people in the agencies that we worked with. And um, uh, shortly in the third year working with Governor Ehrlich, a congressman who I had worked for prior on Capitol Hill called and, uh, and offered, offered me to come work in his office. And, uh, he was a, he's a tremendous person. I'm still working in his office. I'm his legislative director. His name's Howard, Howard Coble from Greensboro, North Carolina, oh. and uh, he is he's a tremendous representative for North Carolina. And I've had a privilege of working with him. Um, at the same time, I've been still working in the family's restaurant in St. Michael's. So all this has crescendoed into the moment that we are in now. You're a busy man. Absolutely. And uh, well. What, some, uh, does something have to give if you're elected to the to the Maryland legislature? The in the moment sort of came together. Um, the congressman is retiring, and um, and I'm running the restaurant, and um, our delegate, uh, who I think has done a fabulous job, and and I'm a I've been a supporter of hers, and I've known her throughout my life. Uh, delegate Jeannie Hadaway Riccio, um, she announced that she was running for lieutenant governor, which which meant that she wasn't going to run for re-election. Um, uh, and so uh, the, my candidacy is moving forward. The general election is coming up. The congressman's retiring, so I will no longer work in his office and use all the experience that I've developed working on Capitol Hill and focus that entirely on the Eastern Shore, which goes back to the district. You know, when you're talking to people and they can't tell which district they're in, I give them my card and say, here's my cell phone number. If you're on the Eastern Shore, I want to help you. Call me up. If I'm not the right guy, I'll find the right guy for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's it, it is it is a sure thing. You know, we're all working together to try to preserve what what we have and build a future for ourselves. Well, I I guess it's true that our voice is weak enough in in Annapolis uh, as uh, underpopulated part of the state <coughs> compared to the that big corridor between Baltimore and Washington, we kind of get lost in the shuffle unless we have good quality people saying and speaking up for us. And so that's why it's so important to us as the voters to have good quality people, uh, articulate people uh, speaking on our behalf. So thank you for, for running.
for for the office, and oh. we wish you good luck. Um, well, we've talked about uh, economic development. Um, some of the regional issues that are important to the people on the Eastern Shore. Well, first, you don't have to thank me for being um, being running for office. It's just an honor to be the candidate. It is. And I try to tell every, I put thank yous on all my signs on the side of the road, at least the ones, the ones that I could get to. <laughs> um, we, you know, we have a number of challenges. Um, uh, you know, right now our seafood industry is, um, is, 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 is not, is, is struggling to survive. Um, when I worked with Governor Ehrlich, I found a very effective way to deal with that is to bring the seafood industry into the discussions. And you've talked to most people that are, that are working on the water they feel like they're on the outside of the decisions that our state's making with regards to regulating the, the fishery and how to bring the fishery back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how we spend money, the balance between regulating and protecting the bay and business, most people would tell you that it's out of whack. Uh, we're regulating and regulating, and it's good to try to protect the Chesapeake Bay, but if we're not improving the overall health of the bay, we're regulating, for, uh, that, 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 that benefit's being nullified. Um, you know, getting the watermen involved in the discussions, using their knowledge, working with the scientists. The, na the Chesapeake Bay is a national, it's a world treasure. Um, everyone wants to see it bounce back. Um, Mother Nature will bring it back quicker than man will, but we have to do what we can to set the stage for Mother Nature to bring it back. Um, you know, one thing that uh, watermen often speak about is power dredging. That's a, it's a, uh, it's a way they harvest oysters, and, and watermen want to talk with the administration. They want to have a policy that allows for power dredging so they can work the bottom and help the oysters come back on their own. Um, that's one big issue for the, for the seafood industry. And, you know, the Chris has been a rough crab harvest because of the weather. Um, there's a number of theories on why the, crab, why the crab population, the harvest has been down, but, you know, it's important that the watermen are included in the discussions about how we're going to bring that that fishery back to where it was, or is that just a cycle that the, that the um, blue crab population is going through? Um, we're having discussions right now about striped bass and the harvest, you know, how are we going to protect that fishery? And if you go up on the shore, you know, the farmers are, 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 are locked in on trying to find a way to deal with the um, phosphorus management rate regulation that's been proposed. And, um, and, and you know, agriculture is the number one um, economic fa economic engine on the shore. Um, uh, simply saying, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to protect the bay. We're, you know, let's find a way. You know, you you find a way to deal with it. I don't think is an effective way to manage the industry from a from a um, from a state's perspective. Um, and then, uh, in addition to um, to seafood and agriculture, you know, there there are, there are a multitude of other small businesses that are. Um, that are suffering, um, and our economy, you know, uh, it, uh, it it goes in cycles. You know, the winter, the winter, we our economy tends to shrink, and in the summer it tends to tends to grow. Um, any way that we can grow our economy in the winter and build a winter time economy on the eastern shore would be a tremendous benefit. Um, mm -hmm. Fees fees have a big impact on small businesses. You know, our the way we implement fees, why we implement fees. Um, I think that needs to be reviewed, and there should be a um, some sort of a mechanism that the citizens and the businesses can rely on when the government's going to impose new fees. They shouldn't be arbitrary or random, yeah. you know. And and the regulations also they should be um, you know the least cost al alternative ought to be implemented. Stakeholders ought to have the ability to participate in the process, um, and there ought to be meaningful review um, when regulations aren't aren't uh, imposed properly. When you were in the Ehrlich uh, administration, did you work with Mary Beth Carroza? Very, very closely. Okay, well, you know, she's a delegate or a candidate for a delegate from 38C, and she was talking about, and I know this will ring a bell with you from St. Michael's. I mean, tourism in St. Michael's and, and its mm -hmm. effect on your business has to be similar to what Mary Beth talks about in, in Ocean City. How can, what role can the state government play in, in boosting tourism in the state of Maryland? Well, tourism is, a, is, a, is, a, is an enormous, uh, has an enormous economic impact in Talbot County, and particularly in my hometown, St. Michael's. 
um, advertising, um, you know, making people aware of what we have to offer. You know, that's, that, that's a big deal. Um, making sure um, that people can get here uh, is, is also critical. Um, the Chesapeake Bay is a key component of our tourism. People come to the Eastern Shore because they want to be near the bay, they want to be around the bay, um, the bay culture. Um, protecting the bay, um, making sure the bay is accessible to, um, to people that want to visit is, um, is, is very important. Um, but also on the um, tourism side is making sure that businesses can grow. Um, you know, if a business, you know, we want to have things, we want to have, uh, we want to attract guests. And if, if we can't provide, if we can't expand our businesses, if we can't do the remodeling, if we can't keep up, they're going to go elsewhere. Um, and when, with new fees, new taxes, things like that, businesses won't spend the money to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, reinvest in, in what they're doing. Um, and and that won't, that if, that, the impact of that, won't, won't, uh, won't, we won't realize that for a few years, but it's a major concern. Um, but tourism is a, is, a, um, is a critical part of our economy in, in St. Michael's. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, the, the connection there with you and Mary Beth, because she mentioned that she worked in the early administration. Um, four counties in 30, 37B, I don't know how many municipal governments there are. You got me. But yeah. they're, they're all looking in, at one time or another during the, during the course of their they're uh, administering the affairs of their county or their city. They're looking to state government for various things. How will you be accessible to all of those all of those municipal uh, city council people and mayors and the four county governments? We'll do the omnipotent Johnny Mouths. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, you, know, you have to go to you have to go to the meetings, and you have to go to the breakfast, and you have to go to the receptions, and you have to develop a relationship so you know the the mayors and the councilmen and councilwomen, and um, and and that's a that, that's another factor that's affecting the shore. You know, when the state pushes off budgetary obligations to local governments, local governments, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road. And when they're given less to work with, or they're forced to to uh, absorb more of a cost that they didn't absorb before, those are major problems. And unless you're meeting with those mayors and the council members and the county commissioners, and you're not aware of what they're dealing with, then you can't advocate for them in Annapolis, which is what your job is as a delegate, to make sure when, you know, if there's a cut, if there's a budget item, to make sure that the, you know, your, your hometown, you know, your, your district is being taken care of. And, you know, it's a, um, I don't think there's any strategy for for being accessible, you just get in your car and you get to where you need to be, and uh, and you just keep moving. And that's been the uh, theme of the campaign is, you know, is there's uh, there's no uh, there's no soundbite for people to vote for you. Yeah. You want to meet them, you want to talk to them, you want them to know who you are, why you're running, you know, what your priorities are, um, where you came from, and um, and how you can help them. And there's um. You know, everybody wants, you know, you, you see the, the um, TV shows or movies where there's some uh, magical line that you can say that's going to solve everyone's problems. That's, you know, that doesn't happen. Um, you know, I want to be accessible and I want to be, um, be ready to help whenever I can and be a strong voice in Annapolis for the Eastern Shore. Um, and uh, and that's, that sounds easy, but it's a, it's a big job. Yeah. Well, the one thing that the, well, several things that the four counties have in common, they all support uh, an education system, right? which is extremely important. Uh, they all have a roads department, extremely important. Both mm -hmm. of those things depend on state government. Um, if somebody says, uh, I know Johnny Mouts, will they also say you'll be an advocate for public education? I think so. If the people that know me, I don't talk a lot about education um, because I feel that if the, the economy drives education, when the economy goes up, everything else improves with it. A education is absolutely critical. You know, if, if our children aren't leaving school prepared, then that's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna bring down 
you know, the, the rest of the rest of our, our community. We need to make sure our, our children are prepared. I'm, I'm, I don't know what the diagnosis is, ADD, um, compulsive obsessive, but I had a very difficult time in school growing up. And I went, I was, I was assigned to all the extra study classes and the special group and, you know, and, and, uh, and, I, and I fought my way through um, middle school and elementary school, most of the time through um, tutoring with my teachers after school. And, um, you know, I, education to me is very personal and it's very unique. And I think, I think it's the same way today. You know, Common Core has caught a, a lot of people's attention and there are a lot of concerns about Common Core. I've even talked about some of my concerns about Common Core. But at the end of the day, you want to make sure the kids that are getting out of school are prepared for, for, for life, for being a productive, independent, successful part of our community, and whatever they, wherever they decide to go and be. Um, you know, money for education is critical. Also, how we teach our children is critical. And they need to, you know, they need to leave school with discipline, with background, with the ability to think, with the ability to write. Um, and the ability to understand. Because, you know, when you leave school with an education, you know, you still need to go into the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the education is your foundation. But if, if kids go through school and they can't think on their own and they can't make decisions and they can't rationalize, um, then we're not going to move forward. We're in a competitive world right now. Um, other countries are producing, you know, children with that are testing higher. That are, they've, there, there are a number of uh, statistics and you can go on and on about them. But and we want an environment in our schools when kids want to go to school and they want to learn and they want to use their ability to, um, to synthesize ideas and come up with new ideas and challenge them. And, you know, you need to, fund, you need to have funding for education, but we also need to make sure that that, that, uh, that, that structure, that environment exists in our schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, teachers are frustrated sometimes when you, teachers are frustrated a lot. <laughs> and teachers are a key part of our education, you yeah. know, and in, in the political you know, you have uh, the teachers have a have their have a, have a weighty uh, position in the political world, but you know, you go into the classroom and let's talk about real life. That student learns from the teacher, and the teacher teaches the student, and it's very important that um, that that relationship is a strong one and a productive one. Yeah, well, you talked about competition uh, for the uh, tourist dollar yes. that's coming. There's a huge competition and attraction for teachers between various counties, between different sections of the state. But one of it seems to me one of the challenges for state government, for a guy who's representing the Eastern Shore, is that Maryland is considered almost first or close to first in every gauge of education nationally. Mm -hmm. Yet there's a difference in education in Somerset County than there is in, let's say, Howard County or Montgomery County. There's because of the n number of dollars spent, and and making it ev even and equal, uh, equal access to a good quality education is something that's been a uh, stumbling block for for us for years. Right. And, I mean, it didn't didn't just happen yesterday. Right. There's been a lot of efforts to try to equalize that, make it. Bring not bring the others down, but bring our Eastern Shore schools up with other parts of the state. So that's a, it's a challenge, and I don't know have have all the answers, but having articulate, educated people in elected office is a good step in the right direction. I think so. Absolutely, and the challenge, uh, like no other, like 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 all others. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Like all others. Um, it's going to require a lot of work, um, a lot of discussion, and a lot of persistence. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things that you have to focus on and um, and just continually work and work and work. Um, and if uh, with the support of of you know the you know, the, the the board of education, the teachers, the students, the parents, um, you know, and working through the policy makers in Annapolis, um, you hope. The hope is to get to where you want to be. Yeah. You know. Well, family business, obligations in Washington, and running for public office, I assume you have the support of your family to do this? I'm blessed with a six-year-old son, Johnny, who is also 
you know, we went through Johnny. I'm Johnny on the ballot, but I've had other names growing up. And uh, my son Johnny is six, and he's in first grade. And he's going to St. Michael's Elementary School, which is, you know, I attended St. Michael's Elementary, or St. Michael's Middle School, as a, as a matter of fact. But, and my daughter Evelyn, she's in pre-K. Oh, my. Uh, and they're, uh, they're, they're uh, very interested in counting. Johnny's very interested in seeing his name on signs on, signs on the side of the road. Uh, uh, my wife, Rebecca, <laughs> and I, we both live in St. Michael's, and um, she's patiently supportive, uh, and, uh, and she's encouraging me, and Johnny and Evie are very excited. Great. But uh, they're excited to have me come home also. You know, the, the, the commute to Washington every day to run the congressman's office, is, um, it's grueling, and it gets you home late. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, being home and using uh, the skills and the background and things that I've done on Capitol Hill and in Annapolis for Governor Ehrlich, you know, for the Eastern Shore, um, and specifically District 37B, it will just be, uh, I, I can't ex express how much how much of an honor it will be and how excited I am about it. Now, are your parents still in, involved in the in the family business? Well, you know, family businesses, you never know who's in charge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, they, they're absolutely involved. Um, my mom had a really bad stroke um, three or four years ago, and um, she's still recovering from the stroke, which is wonderful. And, um, but she's in the restaurant, and the restaurant is something she has shepherded since we, since we first bought it years ago. Wow. And, uh, and uh, she, with the restaurant is a big part of the town. We, we do a lot with town events and charities, and you know, that's, um, it's, the Eastern Shore you know, is so special in that regard, and that you know, the communities, we all get together, we do charities, we support one another, we're all related or friends of a friend or an uncle, and, um, and that's been one of the funnest parts about running for office is I'll go to an event in some place that I hadn't been before. You know, you're meeting new people, and somebody will come up behind me and stick a finger in my back and say, hey, Mounts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so uh, that, that's been a lot of fun. But, yeah, Mom and Dad are still in the, in the saloon quite a bit. My father's a dentist in Easton. And, oh. uh, and he's been practicing dentistry for uh, for 43 years. Wow. Yeah, in, in East and keeping smiles on people's faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Johnny, we're going to pretend that camera is a door. Uh-oh. And you just knocked on that door. Uh -huh. And I want you to look right into that camera and say to the people who come to the door, who you are and what what you what you're asking. Now you're promising there isn't a dog behind the door that's going to come well, after I'm, me. I'm not promising anything. I'm just saying that's the door. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do role playing. Yeah, go ahead. Look okay, knock camera. on the door. Yeah, knock knock. Yeah. Hello, anybody home? Yeah. No answer. Hi, I'm Johnny Mounts. I'm a candidate for the Maryland House of Delegates for District 37B. I have 14 years experience in federal government. Sorry, I have 17 years experience in state and federal government. I run my family's small business. It's a restaurant in St. Michael's. That's Carpenter Street Saloon. I'll be on the ballot this November, and I'm asking for your trust and your vote. Here's my card. My cell phone number's on the card. It's 410-310-6665. Feel free to call me if I can ever be of assistance to you. Thank you for your time. Have a nice day. Very well put. And thank you for coming all this distance to Wicomico County to introduce yourself Johnny Mounts to the people of Wicomico County. And this is my first live interview on camera, and this is also the first time I've ever knocked on a camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, you never know what to expect here at Pac-14, so thanks for coming. Phil, thanks a million for yeah. having me. And good luck to you. I appreciate and it. And your family. Thank and you thank all. Thank you for being with us right here on Pac-14.